momentarily. Are there any questions or um, uh, other quick comments that the folks in the audience may have before we launch into uh, tonight's session? I like to ask this periodically. Good. Uh, Thank you all for coming in uh, from the uh, horrible weather outside. Uh, some of you may have noticed that the university has uh, strung hammocks uh, between some of the trees. There weren't enough of us for us to meet out there, so I will turn this session over to Dean Paul. Thank you very much, uh, Ted, for the camera and for those of you who have not been to any of these sessions uh, yet. My name is Jeremy Paul. And I'm Dean of the Law School at uh, Northeastern. We are delighted to uh, welcome you to this session of the uh, Open Classroom uh, on the Rule of Law in an Age of Polarization uh, and Rapid Change. Uh, and our topic today uh, is uh, access to justice. Uh, you might think back and remember when we started in the first uh, session of this uh, Open Classroom, uh, we talked a little bit about what the Rule of Law uh, means and what it's going to accomplish. Uh, and we said that multiple purposes, uh, some of which we've talked about in other weeks, uh, including protecting uh, individuals and uh, organizations from an overreaching state. Uh, but then another major function of the rule of law is to protect us uh, from uh, nefarious actions of our fellow uh, citizens. Uh, someone steals your property, uh, your landlord throws you out of your apartment, uh, your um, dry cleaner fails to deliver your goods, uh, if you're not able to resolve such matters uh, with uh, private discussions, uh, it's very helpful to know that the uh, government and the courts uh, are available to you uh, to attempt to redress uh, what seemed to you uh, to be wrongs. Uh, but the rule of law can't survive uh, if it turns out that the rule of law is available to some people uh, to redress those wrongs uh, through a court system uh, with, with the aid of lawyers. But, not available to others. Uh, and one of the greatest challenges uh, to an effective rule of law uh, is the way in which uh, our current system uh, in, does provide uh, legal services and access to lawyers uh, to many of us who can afford them, uh, but does not um, apply the same uh, legal representation uh, to those who can't afford to pay for them. So that's going to be one of the themes uh, that we're going to talk about today. And I just wanted to let to um, fill it in so that you see this part of the seamless uh, organization of, of the class. Uh, we truly have a star-studded uh, panel uh, here with us today uh, to talk about these uh, issues. Uh, and I'm going to introduce them briefly in the order that they are uh, going to speak. Uh, then, as is always the case, we will uh, show our film uh, clips, and then the speakers will each speak, and then we'll take uh, an opening questions. So our first speaker tonight uh, is Chief Justice Ralph D. Gantz of the uh, Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. Uh, he became the 37th Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court in July of 2014. Uh, Chief Justice Gantz was appointed as an Associate Justice uh, on the court in January of 2009. Uh, before joining the SJC, uh, he served for more than 11 years uh, as an Associate Justice of the Massachusetts Superior Court and was Administrative Justice of the Superior Court's Business Litigation uh, se Session in 2008. Uh, Chief Justice Gantz was born in New Rochelle, New York. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree from Harvard College, uh, graduating summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, then he completed a diploma in criminology at Cambridge University in England. Uh, in 1980, he earned a law degree in magna cum laude from Harvard Law School, where he was the note editor of the Harvard Law Review. Uh, he began his legal career as a law clerk to United States District Court Judge Jim Nickerson, uh, and then served as a special assistant to FBI Director at William Webster. If we had another day, uh, you can tell us a little bit about the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Chief Justice Gantz later served as Assistant U.S. Attorney in Massachusetts and Chief of the uh, Police Corruption Unit before joining the Boston Law Firm, formerly known as Palmer and Dodge. All his law firms are formerly known. Uh, where he practiced law until he was appointed to the Superior Court by Governor William Wells. Uh, Chief Justice Gantz has taught at Harvard Law School, New England Law, Boston, and Northeastern University School of Law. Uh, Chief Justice Gantz is also chair of the Supreme Judicial Court Standing Committee on Model Jury Instructions on Homicide and the SJC Indigenous Committee and significantly was co-chair of the Massachusetts Access to Justice Commission uh, from 2010 to 2015. 
among his awards and honors of the 2017 Massachusetts Bar Foundation, a great friend of Justice Award, the 2016 Hasbro Cohen Award for Distinguished Judicial Service, the Boston Bar Association Citation of Judicial Excellence, and the Suffolk Law School Public Service Award. Uh, speaking of your friends, he's also been a longtime great friend of Northeastern Law School, and we're delighted to have you here. Uh, our second speaker, a uh, longtime uh, but now uh, retired member of the Northeastern Law School uh, faculty, uh, Professor Stephen Subrin. Uh, Professor Subrin is a leading authority on civil procedure and has published extensively on his subject with an emphasis on procedural reform and the historical background of the federal rules of civil procedure. Uh, he has taught civil procedure, evidence, complex litigations, alternative dispute resolution, federal courts, civil trial practice, and law and literature, life as a lawyer. And now he's actually teaching a course in the undergraduate school uh, on railroads and the law, so we get to hear about that too. Uh, Professor Subin is co-author of a seminal casebook, Civil Procedure, Doctrine, Practice, and Context, uh, and with Professor Mark K. Wu, who was an earlier speaker in our series, uh, he has written a text about American civil procedure for the Chinese legal community, published in Chinese, and litigating the American civil procedure in context. Before joining the Northeastern faculty, Professor Subin practiced civil litigation and labor law for seven years at the Boston firm of Burns and Levinson, where he became a partner in 1966. He's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School, and he's going to talk to us today about juries and trials by juries. Our final speaker is uh, Jacqueline Bowman, who is the Executive Director of Greater Boston uh, Legal Services, where she has been in that position since August of 2011. Uh, she is responsible for the overall management and operations of Greater Boston Legal Services. She initially started work there as a senior attorney and then managing attorney in the family of law units. Uh, she left them for a while. Uh, 1991 to work at the Massachusetts Law Reform Institute uh, as the state support attorney for family and juvenile law matters, uh, but Greater Boston Legal Services beckoned, uh, and she returned to them uh, in 1998, first as associate director and then later became the deputy director. She's a nationally recognized expert in family and juvenile law, as well as in law practice management. Uh, director Bowman served on the Access to Justice Commission of the SJC, as well as several boards of nonprofit. After graduating from Antioch School of Law in 1979, she began her legal career working on behalf of the poor at West Tennessee Legal Services in Jackson, Tennessee, a uh, passion <coughs> and commitment that she has <coughs> So we're delighted to have you all here. We thank you so much, and we look forward to a great evening. Uh, good evening, uh, and thank you for having me here. Uh, I don't quite know where to begin, but let me see if I can at least address some of the issues that were discussed in the movie, which is the first time that I saw it. Uh, I must say, when I did see uh, uh, Justice O'Connor, I was thinking and hoping it was going to be actually a quite wonderful video that the National Association of Women Judges have produced, uh, uh, mostly, but not entirely, uh, for those 47 states which have some election of their judges. Uh, and she begins it speaking about the essence of the concept of fairness and the fact that Every four-year-old understands what fairness means, that it is fundamental to our system of justice, and that we rely on our judicial system to ensure a quality of fairness. So if you do get a chance, if you want to see Justice O'Connor again, God bless her, uh, go to the National Association of Women Judges website. It's only about five minutes. It is very much worth seeing, because it is, I think, the single best if you had five minutes, there is no better way to spend it in terms of understanding what it means to have a workable justice system. Uh, I'm, I'm going to remark only about a few things as I'm listening to that, and I'm going to speak about the topic that I am here to discuss, which is civil access to justice. Uh, I, there is a certain irony in having the Supreme Court discuss the importance of jury trials, since uh, the Supreme Court has actually been instrumental in markedly restricting the access to jury trials through its interpretation of the Federal Arbitration Act, uh, in which it has enabled individuals by agreement, including the type of agreements that are on page eight of the nine-page form that you don't read when you sign any particular consumer installment or, cons or, or uh, consumer uh, debt instrument. Uh, that means that you have waived your right to a jury trial, uh, and that uh, you have lost the ability to go to a court in order to, uh, <coughs> in order to uh, uh, challenge uh, what you consider to be an unfair and deceptive practice. Uh, 
And it means that there are no class actions available when you do that because there are no class actions in arbitration. And when the debts involved are between $100 and $1,000, there's no other realistic way in order to accomplish it. And the US Supreme Court, in a recent decision, said, well, we sort of understand, not in these words, but we sort of understand that you will be effectively deprived of any remedy if you do it because the cost of arbitration will exceed the amount at issue. Uh, but that's how we seek to interpret the Federal Arbitration Act. Uh, my court had it, it interpreted it differently, uh, but they win. Uh, 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 with regard to fines and fees, uh, there has been, Massachusetts is among those states uh, which has imposed uh, fines and fees, and uh, I have been uh, encouraging the legislature to change that, and I am pleased to say that the issue of fines or fees are very much front and center with respect to the present criminal justice reform bill, both in the House and the Senate. Uh, and we also have taken a look at what was, what we call here the indigent counsel fee. And yes, we do have an indigent counsel fee of $150. If you were declared to be indigent, uh, we have through rule last year been able to make sure that nobody is to serve any time in jail for the failure to pay that and that it may be waived uh, because of financial circumstances, but it still remains on the books and it still is a matter of concern. Uh, issues of, we have actually been among the nation's leaders with regard to addressing issues of fines and fees. I think we are the, probably the only state uh, that says that uh, the ability to pay must be considered, not only with regard to whether or not you are to be incarcerated for the failure to pay, and that is indeed a constitutional requirement, which every judge must first determine that a person's failure to pay is willful because you have the financial ability to pay and you have chosen not to, and it's not willful if you simply cannot afford it. Uh, but also we have applied that in the, in the areas of restitution, uh, much to the dismay of certain judges uh, who have been the position in which Mrs. O'Leary was, when the contractor did not manage to build the porch for Mrs. O'Leary and walked away with her $20,000 uh, and is charged criminally with regard to that. And the uh, and then says, I cannot afford to pay the $20,000 to Mrs. O'Leary. Uh, judges are not able to put him in jail or threaten him in jail, even though many judges know that if they do, somebody will come up with the money, perhaps not him, but it could be Uncle Joe, it could be Mom, it could be Dad, it could be somebody else seeking to spare him from jail. And that has been a matter which has been very much a source of controversy, but it is ultimately the law because ability to pay is a, uh, <coughs> is a constitutional requirement for there to be any willful failure to pay. I will also note that the memorandum which you saw issued by the Department of Justice in 2016 has been withdrawn a month ago by the current Department of Justice. Uh, uh, that the national, the, the, uh, the Conference of Chief Justices is right now embarked on a national effort to address issues of fines and fees and has sent a memorandum to all Chief Justices to say the fact that the Department of Justice has withdrawn the memorandum does not in any way bear on the efforts that we are going to be having in each of our states in order to address concerns of fines and fees. And those concerns are very real. Uh, and they're very difficult, because the fact of the matter is there's a fair amount of money generated by fines and fees. And if you get rid of the fines and fees, the question the legislature asks is, OK, so where are we going to find that money? Uh, part of the answer is it is not a great use of probation officers to be serving as collection agents. And we can more effectively use probation to be actually providing supervision than to be serving as individuals who are there simply to collect relatively small quantities of money. And it's also true that the ultimate sanction of incarceration for willful failure to pay is not a great use of taxpayer money. But those are arguments which we are presently right now before the legislature. And uh, you are welcome, indeed encouraged, to reach out to your particular legislature and speak, legislator and speak of the importance of managing to reform uh, our practice with regard to fines and fees in Massachusetts. Uh, I want to speak about the matter that uh, was also addressed, which is civil access to justice. Uh, in Massachusetts, uh, there is a right to counsel when liberty is at issue. Uh, liberty is at issue in every criminal case. 
but we also determine that liberty is an issue in certain types of civil cases. Specifically, if the Department of Children's and Families uh, intends to remove your child from your custody because you are believed to be unfit to parent that child, that is viewed as a liberty interest and there is a right to counsel, uh, not only for each of the two parents, but also for the child. So there are, other, there are some areas involving matters of family law where we have determined that liberty is at issue uh, and therefore there is a right to counsel. Uh, but in the vast majority of family, family issues, the ones generally addressed in family court with regard to divorces and separations where child custody is a major issue, uh, there is no right to counsel. Uh, there is also no right to counsel, as was noted, uh, when individuals are faced with the loss of their homes, either because of eviction or because of foreclosure. There is no right to counsel when a uh, lender comes after uh, somebody for the failure to pay a student loan or for the failure to pay a medical debt or for the failure to pay a credit card debt. Uh, and that turns out those three areas, the areas of family law, the areas of housing, the areas of debt collection, are the areas, I think, in which one can say are the ones most likely to bear on an individual's uh, ability to parent a child, to reside in a home, uh, to manage to uh, pay other debts, to be able to maintain a credit rating, uh, for which individuals go without counsel. So, the issue that we have in Massachusetts, uh, as we do throughout the country, is how can we provide a degree of fairness to individuals who are seeking to represent themselves. Uh, there is, right now in the legal services community, a great debate as to whether to call these individuals. And the debate is worthy of note because it says something about how we view these individuals. Uh, there is a group of people, uh, well, I'm not sure which side Jackie is on, we'll perhaps find out, uh, that insist that they should be referred to as unrepresented because they are. Uh, being unrepresented focuses on the fact that they do not have the advice of counsel uh, and that we need to do whatever we can to help them. There is a second group of people uh, who says, no, we should be referring to them as self-represented because they are representing themselves. Uh, the argument for that is that we need to make those who are unrepresented self-represented by providing them with the information, the guidance, the support that will al allow them to be able to articulate their claims, to identify what their uh, claims should be, their defenses should be, so that they at least have a fair opportunity to present those arguments and those facts to a judge and attempt to get a fair trial. Uh, so there is, one can say that the aspiration is to make those who are unrepresented self-represented. Uh, and uh, one response to that is, well, that's still, even if you're self-represented, you still have a fool for a lawyer because uh, <laughs> the fact of the matter is, going to law school does matter. Uh, you do learn something in law school in terms of your ability to represent yourself. Uh, and moreover, even if you are a lawyer, you should not be representing yourself in these matters because uh, that you need the guidance of somebody who is not so much involved in the case and can provide you with a different perspective. But the fact of the matter is we do not live in that particular world. There is no, uh, right now with regard to legal services, legal services is turning away, Jackie can correct me, I would say uh, about 60% of those who come to them for legal, uh, legal aid, that's only those who are actually eligible uh, for legal services. Uh, uh, which is those who are 125% of the poverty line, all those who are above are not even eligible for it. The fact of the matter is the amount of resources devoted to legal service is pitifully small. Uh, the current budget federally uh, for legal service funding is $385 million. Uh, that is the federal amount. Uh, if one were to look to see what happened 42 years ago when the Legal Service Corporation was first begun, uh, if one were to take its budget back then and add inflation onto it, the amount of that budget should be somewhere in the ballpark of $950 million. And back then, there were roughly 12 million people who were eligible for those legal services, and presently there are 40 million people who are eligible for those.
those legal services. Fortunately, in Massachusetts, we rely only to a relatively small degree on federal funding because it's not there. Uh, we depend upon our state legislature to assist us. We depend upon uh, in lawyers and other individuals to come forward with money. But even though we actually are doing better than most states in terms of the number of legal services attorneys and the availability of services, including pro bono services of private attorneys, we are still pathetically small in terms of the number of persons who can truly represent them. So the question is twofold. One question is, how are you going to provide some decent quality of information to these individuals to allow them to some degree to represent themselves? How are you going to leverage the relatively small number of attorneys you have in order to maximize what they can do for individuals, which forges legal services to begin to make important decisions as to whether they're going to be focusing on so-called impact litigation to focus on major cases which may affect the lives of many people, so <coughs> sort of a macro focus, or whether they're going to be attempting to focus their resources on trying to maximize the number of individuals that they can uh, represent. It also forces us to recognize that uh, we need to look not only at legal problems, but simply at problems. Uh, when one looks at issues involving the poor or the working class, or for that matter, the middle class, uh, it turns out that uh, what to us we may see as legal problems, to them are simply problems. I don't have enough money to pay my rent. My landlord wants to kick me out. Uh, I am having uh, serious troubles at home and I need to get a divorce and I would like to be able to have custody of my child or at least to be able to see my child. I do not have enough money to pay my student loan or to pay the credit card debt and they are coming after me. Uh, we may see those as legal problems, but the individual who are facing them, they are simply problems. Uh, one dilemma that we are facing is the fact that people do not necessarily recognize legal problems to be legal problems. Uh, so the mere fact of seeking legal assistance is for them not the first thing that they may think of. Uh, that means that we need to begin to step back before one gets to court and begin to leverage whatever resources that we may have to be able to help those individuals address those problems. And by leveraging resources, I'm referring to social service agencies, I'm referring to public libraries, I'm referring to churches, synagogues, and mosques. I'm referring to all of the range of services which may permit people to assist them with regard to addressing those particular problems. Uh, I, I have probably on this been two minutes and, brief and talk only about, uh, I wear two hats uh, right now, uh, probably more than that, but I wanted to mention two. Uh, one is Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court. The second is, and I need to update my bio, uh, that I am back as co-chair of the Access to Justice Commission uh, as of last year. Uh, so I wear that hat. They are somewhat different hats. I have a rather superb co-chair, which means that when those hats manage to conflict, I let Sue Finnegan handle the particular matters uh, that where it would be inappropriate for me as a judge to deal with them. Uh, but uh, in those particular hats, the fact of the matter is we have strategic action plans that we have put forward both for the courts, uh, dealing with issues of fairness, issues of trying to simplify the forms, simplify the procedures, uh, and attempt issues of language access, which is, as you may expect, an enormous and growing problem in our courts in terms of the sheer need for interpreters um, and, the, and, the, and the sheer number of languages for which we need interpreters, uh, but also an access to justice uh, strategic action plan, which is focused on the three, three issues that I have discussed, issues of debt collection, issues of family law, and issues of, uh, of housing. Uh, we are hard at work to attempt to leverage the resources we have to be working in a complementary fashion with the courts to seek to encourage them to, to, to simplify the legal processes, to, to, to try to attempt to increase the number of legal services and, and legal resources available, to maximize all the other resources to develop, to have court service centers, which we have in six of our primary courts, but to attempt to develop a virtual court service center, which will be available to those who are not going to, who are going to be either not going to any of those courts or who simply would prefer to be doing it when they're sitting in the subway looking at their cell phone or at home in their pajamas looking at a computer if they have one. Uh, realistically, mostly the cell phone because the fact of the matter is the poor may not have computers, but about 8% of the poor 
actually have cell phones and those numbers are increasing over time. The cell phone right now is, uh, the smartphone right now is our single greatest means to provide information to the poor and we need to make access to that. Uh, so it is a formidable problem uh, because when one deals with these issues, the one thing which you recognize rather quickly is first of all, the one thing the poor are rich in is problems. Uh, there are very few persons who are poor in this country who have only one problem. Uh, they very often are going to be dealing with a whole host of problems. Problems with regard to housing, problems perhaps with regard to issues of mental health or drug addiction, problems with regard to the education for their child and making sure that that child is receiving uh, the special education that particular child may need, problems with regard to issues of debt collection, uh, and it's relatively democratic because right now, 23%, uh, nearly one in four uh, persons in Massachusetts have matters under collection. It is a huge problem. It's a problem not limited to the poor. Uh, and when one looks to see who is seeking to collect those debts, it turns out to be a remarkably small number of debt collectors. Most of those debts that are seeking, that have, that have come to collection are debts which have been sold, sometimes for five or 10 cents uh, on the dollar, uh, and those particular individuals are seeking to collect. I think the numbers right now is that 37% uh, of our civil docket in our district courts uh, are brought by uh, seven plaintiffs. Uh, seven plaintiffs, seven debt buyers currently uh, comprise nearly 40% of our civil docket, uh, which speaks of the enormity of the issue, the importance of being able to address issues of fairness and debt collection, and the importance of providing information so individuals know what to do and how to do it when they are seeking to collect a debt. So with that, you know, recognizing the limitation of time, and recognizing that you're going to hear not only from Professor Subrin, but also from Jackie, who knows much more about this than I do, uh, I'm going to stop. So thank you so much. Thank you. This is really depressing. Um, and I'm not going to add in any way to very much optimism. I want to talk to you tonight about civil litigation in the federal court. Uh, I don't know how many are lawyers or law students or just aware of the legal system. Civil litigation is everything that's non-criminal litigation. So these are discrimination cases, breach of contract, personal injuries, uh, antitrust cases that are not criminal antitrust. Uh, if you look at the front page of the newspaper, it represents a lot of the litigation you'd be reading about. Um, as Chief Justice Gans pointed out, it was ironic hearing uh, Chief Justice, uh, excuse me, Justice O'Connor and Alita talk about the uh, right to a jury trial, which in the federal court system has almost reached a vanishing point. The data is astonishing. And let, let me, I'm not great on statistics, but I know enough to know that this is dramatic. <laughs> when I became a lawyer in 1963, of the terminated cases in federal court, 6,890 and 89 uh, were disposed of by a trial. So that's about 7,000. In 1985 was the peak <coughs> That got to be a little over 11,500. Today, it's about 2,400. So of all the federal terminations, you've got about 2,500 terminated by a trial at all. Um, as far as jury trials go, it's a similarly uh, depressing statistic. When I became a lawyer in 63, the jury trials in the United States, federal courts were 3,200 or so, 
It reached a peak in 87 at over 6,000. It's now about 2,000. Um, to me, the most astonishing data is that when I became a lawyer, 12% of the terminated cases in federal district courts, that's the trial court level, I'm talking about civil cases, 12% were as a result of a trial. Today it's less than 1%. Now, maybe this is the most astonishing statistic. 1963, I became a lawyer. The average federal district court judge heard every month two civil trials, presided over two civil trials. Today, it's one civil trial over three months. So the average federal district court judge today hears fewer than four civil trials a year, as against 24 in 1963. So this is called the vanishing trial issue on the civil side in federal district courts. Now, federal litigation is a very small percentage of total litigation in the country, maybe 5%, something like that. But the trends have taken place elsewhere in the state court level. Not as dramatic, I don't think, in Massachusetts. Uh, Justice Gantz could answer that. But throughout the country, it's pretty dramatic, the reduction of the right to trial at all or jury trial. It's just not happening. It's gone, basically. Why do I care? What difference does it make? Why should you care? Well, as the film started by pointing out, uh, of all the parts of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, <clears throat> the colonists looked at the right to trial and the right to trial by jury as an essential part of the democracy. Just as the legislature should have balanced the executive and just as the House was to balance the Senate, and just as the judiciary was to balance the other two branches, the jury was thought as a method of balancing the power of judges acting alone and balancing the power of business and the rich of the society. It's pretty clear there would have been no Constitution. They, the colonists would not have agreed to it without the right to trial by jury. Now, why? Why is it so important that in a realistic way, Americans can have trials and jury trials? There are really two parts to answer that question. One is the quality of adjudication. Do trials and jury trials do a good job? But the colonists never thought that was solely the purpose of having trials and juries. They looked at it as a political instrument, as a way of giving power to ordinary citizens. All right, let's look at the adjudication part. Is it a good way to decide cases to have a trial and more specifically a jury trial? Jurors are six people or 12 people as against to one single judge. One thing we know now is that judges, like everybody else on this planet cannot escape their experience and cannot escape their biases no matter how hard they try. You can't get to a jury ordinarily by contributing to a campaign to have them elected. You can't get to a jury 
to bribe them except in the most unusual of circumstances. A jury provides a community of people to counterbalance judges who, no matter how they try, have limited experience. And at the federal level, a large percentage of judges have been prosecutors or have come from rather large corporate law offices, although the litigation side of those offices. It, this is a pretty select group of people who does not represent uh, the bulk of the United States of America. Um, the jury, a trial itself is a quite dramatic event. Um, it represents real human beings telling real stories. Uh, it represents lawyers passionately telling narratives. It has cross-examination. Um, reading a brief, you can kind of roll your eyes over. It's, it's pretty hard if the lawyers are good not to pay attention to a trial, not to pay attention to the liveness of it. I mean, it's why we go to plays. In addition to reading novels, there's something about real human beings in front of you that could change the way you look at things. By the way, uh, Ralph, a few years ago I found out two SJC chief justices had sat on juries. I don't know if you've gotten to, I got to sit on a jury. Um, the data shows that lawyers, judges when they're allowed, litigants themselves, everyone ends up being impressed with how serious juries take the obligation to try to do justice. And by the way, many of the most important issues that are litigated today are not, are not ordinary facts. It's not like who went through a red light. I mean, the, the most litigated issues are unreasonableness, unfair competition, intentional discrimination. These are not fact issues in the ordinary sense of a hard fact. These are a combination of fact and law joining together, which is just the place you want a community input. So the, the, the idea of trial and jury trial as far as um, a, a good way of resolving disputes is there, but probably more importantly is the place of the jury trial as a counterpoise to absolute power in wealth. One of my favorite quotes came from Senator Whitehouse, and he, he was speaking at the 75th anniversary of the rules of civil procedure in federal court. This was in 2013. I'm going to quote him directly. I think that an institution that makes popular sovereignty real, an institution that checks the encroachments of the wealthy and powerful, an institution that brings ordinary Americans together to make important decisions in their community, that's an institution that is well worth all the trouble. And by the way, the data is that it's, all not, it's not all that much trouble. Yes, it's more expensive than a bench trial without a jury. But we are talking about dramatically more expensive. The colonists, and then when they became states, looked at the jury trial as a way of educating ordinary citizens in what it means to be a citizen. It's a way of having ordinary citizens with different beliefs sitting together in a room talking civilly to each other and disputing something so that 
The idea, oh, by the way, I probably should have to say this. The word efficiency does not appear in the Bill of Rights. It does not appear in the Constitution. That's not how they were judging trials and juries on whether it was an efficient way as opposed to a fair way, a democratic way. How did it happen? that in my adult lifetime as a lawyer, we went from 12% of the cases being determined by a trial in federal court to fewer than 1%. How did that happen? This was not an accident. It's not something that just happened. Between 1962 and 1975, the number of terminated, well, the number of both commenced and terminated cases in federal court doubled. In the next decade, it doubled again. Today, there are about 460% more cases being commenced and terminated in federal court than in 1963 when I became a lawyer. There was a burgeoning caseload in federal court, largely based on federal legislation giving more rights to ordinary citizens. I mean, that's the reason there was this increase in litigation in the federal courts. Um, the federal judges panicked. I mean, they, they were concerned about this Virgin and caseload, could, could they handle it? And what they did is they implemented at large scale something called case management, whereby from the time a case gets commenced in federal court, the judges took control. And this is not hyperbole. Over time, their major goal was to dispose of cases without a trial. Let me give you a quote. They educated new federal judges at school in Washington, D.C. One of the educators, this is 1971, this is a quote. This is what he taught new judges. My goal is to settle all my cases. Most of the time when I try a case, I consider that I have sometime, somehow failed. There's a federal district court judge <laughs> saying he failed if there's a trial. Um, the judge must not only explore settlement, but must actively pursue it with all the vigor at his command. So this was not an accident. The pressure put on litigants to dispose of their cases without going to trial is enormous. But it's not only uh, at case management that the restriction, the attempt to keep cases from going to trial took place. As Chief Justice mentioned, the Supreme Court, <coughs> particularly the conservative members of it, have consistently tried to keep plaintiffs out of court. And if they get to court, have tried to make sure they're thrown out prior to trial. Let me give you four examples. One is what's called summary judgment. That's where the judge hears based on discovery whether or not there is an issue to go to trial, which those of us who have been lawyers know is highly subjective, whether or not there's a sufficiency of evidence to admit, permit a jury to hear it. Then there's something called 12B6 motion. 
Those are motions on the pleadings to get rid of cases that are in a series of cases the Supreme Court has said, we aren't using this enough. This isn't, a, this isn't something to be discouraged and made it much easier to get rid of cases at the pleading stage. And then as Chief Justice Gantz mentioned, they've made a career out of enforcing mandatory arbitration, and they put a lid on class actions. Um, the major case <clears throat> that permitted cases to be disposed of on the pleadings is called equal. Four of the five majority judges in that case had been active members in the Federalist Society. Now let me tell you a little bit about that. It's not just that the judiciary, for case management reasons and other reasons, turned against trials. There was a concerted effort by the business community and by conservatives to do in litigation. Um, let me give you a few examples. Starting in the 1950s, particularly the insurance industry, invested over $10 million per year in Time Magazine, Sports Illustrated, other popular magazines, denigrating plaintiff lawyers and juries. So let me give you an example. These are, uh, there are pictures usually. The top of them are, the lawsuit crisis is bad for babies. The loss of a crisis is penalizing high school students. The media took up the uh, words. Everybody is suing everybody. This didn't just <coughs> happen to juries and trial got denigrated. This was a conscious effort through advertisements and otherwise to discourage and denigrate plaintiff lawyers and juries. You might recall those of us who are a little older, the, the, the Bush Quill campaign of 1988, Genrich in Contract from America, squashing litigation was at the top of their agendas. They're desperate to keep people out of trials and away from jurors. The Federal Society was founded in 1981. A tenet was there was something wrong with litigation. We ought to control it. And it, it, it's not an accident. They took very seriously the attempt to get conservative circuit court judges and Supreme Court judges. The law and economics movement did the same thing. It prioritized efficiency above concepts of democracy, concepts of community input, concepts basically of democracy. Is it too late to do anything about it? I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll, there is some good news. There is empirical data that shows that the best case management is to set a firm trial date with firm discovery dates. Lawyers will settle their cases without judges doing anything else than insisting this is the day, show up for trial. I mean, that, that, there's da that, 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 that data shows that. Whether or not we can convince the judges, federal judges who have spent so much time with motion after motion and calling people in and trying to get them settled, whether we can convince them that if they did that, they would settle as many cases as spending their time <coughs> with case management. Um, when I became a lawyer in 1963, 53% of terminated cases in federal court had no 
judicial involvement. Judges did nothing except set the case for trial. Today in federal court, only 17% of the cases have no judicial involvement. Um, each of you might think when you hear people talk about ambulance chasers and runaway jurors and all that, it wouldn't hurt if each of you stopped to think. You know, there's a reason we have trials, there's a reason we have jury trials, and you don't fall for the propaganda that going to trial or juries are a bad thing. Thank you. Good to see a lot of people here. Um, my undergraduate major um, was um, history. So I'm going to go back in time and talk a little bit about history and access to justice. In the United States, equal justice under the law is a fundamental concept. And we like to think that we are a free, democratic society and we provide equal access to justice to everyone because we're the United States and we're the best in the world. Unfortunately, it's not true. The Magna Carta uh, back in England in the 1300s came up with the concept of fundamental fairness and equal justice. That's the old English law that a lot of our common law is based on. But somehow or another, access to justice, equal access to justice, has kind of fallen short in the United States. In a number of other countries, England, um, the European, uh, various European countries, France, <coughs> Spain, uh, they provide free lawyers to people who cannot afford lawyers. They also support a legal aid society to the tune of 10 times as much as the United States. So we know in the United States that millions of people who are facing critical life decisions, particularly in the civil courts, don't have access to counsel. And in many instances, we look for ways to kind of adjust for that. Uh, Justice Gantz talked about um, self-represented versus unrepresented. And I sort of fall in the middle. I think that there are some people who are self-represented, and they're self-represented because they want to be. But there are many more people who are unrepresented and they're unrepresented because they don't have access to a lawyer. And so for me, I think the solution falls in a couple of different areas. One is, we can make the court and the justice system a little bit easier for the regular person on the street to interact with. Why do people need so many lawyers? I think, uh, Professor Subrin talked about when he became a lawyer in 1963. I also think there weren't that many lawyers in 1963 as there are today. And maybe one of the reasons that there are so many cases in the federal courts is because there are so many lawyers. But unfortunately, there aren't enough lawyers who are able, not just willing, but able to take on cases without getting paid. The cost of law school today is somewhat prohibitive. And you wonder why people go to law school. Maybe there's nothing else to do. In the United States, only a small fraction of people who have legal issues are able to access a lawyer. For people who are poor, low income, uh, not enough access to funds, probably one in five of their legal issues even make it to court. And 80% of them across the board do not have lawyers. When you peel back the layers and you look at who has lawyers in different kinds of cases, 90% of people in the probate and family court in Massachusetts, at least one party is not represented. 
In the housing courts, you have similar numbers. The landlord might have an attorney, maybe not if you're moderate income. Tenants tend not to have attorneys. Over the years, there have been numerous studies that have indicated that having a lawyer can make a difference in a case. And it's not because lawyers can lie and make the case sound good. It's because the lawyers understand the justice system and the lawyers can point to the things that will make a difference when the judge or the jury is making a decision. If you don't know how the game is played, you're not going to win. You take something like immigration, for example. There was a study in 2016 by the Vera Institute that found that of the children who are represented by counsel, 80% of them avoid deportation. Why is that? The rules have to be clear for everyone who participates in the justice system in order to truly have access to justice. If there was funding, there's a, there's a project in New York City where they are able to come up with some funding and some attorneys to represent people who are facing deportation. And based on a preliminary study, it is believed that people who win their deportation cases will increase by 1,000% if you give those people an attorney. Why is that? And you can play that same statistic out for a significant number of other cases. In the housing court, there have been various different studies. Um, Professor uh, Greiner at Harvard Law School, doing random sampling, found out that people who were represented by counsel were able to retain their housing in more than two-thirds of the cases whereas people without counsel lost their housing in the majority of those cases. In the United States, we think providing access to justice and access to the courts is the sort of gold standard of a democratic society. And we say to people, you can resolve your disputes by going to court. But if people go to court and they don't know what to do while they're there, they're not able to win their cases while they're there. Is that really providing them access to justice? Around the turn of the century, uh, not this century, actually, 1800s, <laughs> in the late 1800s, there were a number of uh, legal aid societies that were begun. Most of them were started in order to provide services to immigrants who were being cheated out of their money um, and their resources. One of the um, earlier legal services programs, if not the first one, is the Legal Aid Society in New York. There was a gentleman by the name of Arthur von Griesen, who was a strong advocate of legal aid societies. He helped start one in New York, he started one in Detroit, and um, pulled together a group of people to uh, begin to think about it. And one of the things that he said was that creating a legal services program keeps the poor satisfied because it establishes and protects their rights. And furthermore, it's the best argument against the socialist who cries that the poor have no rights which the rich are bound to respect. He expanded an institutionalized program specifically to discourage new immigrants from joining radical movements by persuading them that the American legal system was fair. This notion was arguably also behind the creation of the Legal Services Program. It started under the old um, Office of Economic Opportunities in 1964 as part of the War on Poverty. <coughs> One of the notions behind that was you give poor people a lawyer, they're out of the streets. The first director of the Legal Services Corporation said, the money is being used to provide legal assistance to the poor. It means national recognition that the least affluent members of our society 
had at least as many legal problems as the rest of us, and probably more. It means national recognition that the poor are least equipped with the resources and resilience to obtain fair treatment, and accordingly, least able to cope with the landlord, the merchant, the welfare official, the policeman, people you and I handle with relative ease in the unlikely event that we ever see them. And that competent advocacy in the form of a lawyer, an articulate friend, can improve the lot and the dignity of the poor. The OEO seeks the achievement of some greater approximation of equal justice for the poor, equal significance as human beings. So the thinking was, help people be able to reclaim their dignity, help poor people be able to make their case for justice. So let's put some money behind that and let's quell the riots in the streets. So you have to remember what was going on at that time. That was in the mid 60s. Huh. Hmm. Uh, that was in the mid 60s. Anyway, you don't need to look at me. <laughs> <laughs> and there was also the argument that was used to convince Congress in 1974 to fund the Legal Services Corporation. <coughs> Nixon was president. People went to him and said, hey, this program is a successful program. It is making a difference. People are not running around in the streets, burning up things. People are not joined in the Communist Party or the Socialist Party or what have you. We think it's a great program, and we think that it can make a difference. After some haggling back and forth, President Nixon agreed and he signed the Legal Services Corporation Act. The goal at that time was to provide two attorneys per 10,000 poor people in every county of the United States. <coughs> Chief Justice Gantz gave you the number. If funding had continued, we would be probably close to a billion dollars. <coughs> One of the issues with the Legal Services Corporation, however, is that it only provides lawyers for people who are extremely poor. An individual making just under $15,000 a year. A family of four making just over $31,000 a year. There are a lot of people who can't afford lawyers who are not poor enough to be able to qualify for legal aid. But even so, within the legal aid system, we turn away 64% of the people who are eligible for our services. We have to prioritize the cases that we provide representation to. To give you a very real example of what that looks like, you got two victims of domestic violence coming into your office. They both want to get legal representation, but you only have the capacity to take on one case. What do you do? you have to make a determination as to which one is most in danger. That is a difficult situation to be in. But even beyond that, in 1995, with the, um, I have to think of a nice way to say it, but, but the Gingrich uh, Congress, um, <laughs> with a focus on self-representation, self-care, self-sufficiency, basically said, we're taking away the Legal Services Corporation because people don't need to have that kind of uh, legal advocacy. People don't need to have lawyers who are going to advocate for them to create a better social justice system. People don't need to have lawyers doing impact advocacy. And so they restricted the number and the types of cases that lawyers could handle at the same lawyers in the Legal Services Corporation funded programs could handle. And at the same time, they cut the funds. So that today, there are significantly less than one attorney per 6,000 poor people in the United States. That's not access to justice. So when you, when you think about what is access to justice, don't we care? Don't we have shared goals that we're all trying to pursue? Don't we care that our fellow person is not able to stay in their house, not able to get 
food stamps that they're entitled to receive, not able to get cash assistance so that they can raise their families with dignity. If we care about that, we should care about access to justice. We should care about what happens when poor people go to court. We should care that poor people don't have access to lawyers. Creating a legal services system for poor people is actually a good thing, but let's fund it. I think we have to do a couple of things. One is I think we have to fund legal services adequately. We already have, particularly in Massachusetts, a significant number of private attorneys donating pro bono hours to represent people. If every single attorney in Massachusetts donated pro bono hours, we would still not be able to meet the need. That is not the solution. Our current president believes that charity should provide access to justice, that people should be able to go to church and get some funds to pay for a lawyer, that pro bono attorneys ought to be doing more, and that people should be able to represent themselves in court. He does not believe that that is a function of government. But if we are to be a government that is fair and democratic, it is our responsibility. The Supreme Court of the United States didn't agree, and we have to do it state by state. Fortunately, we are in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts where we care about our fellow people. America is deeply committed to individual rights, but in practice, few people can afford it. Thank you. So let's just start by opening the question. Let's let have questions for each other. Hi, I kind of want to push back on the idea of um, a jury trial being more fair than a judge. Um, in most situations, juries are, it's not really a jury of your peers, it's a jury of like, who's available at that time, so it's usually people that are pretty well to do, they're responsible, have some, some sort of civic responsibility, usually white, um, and then they are judging usually people that find themselves in situations, demographics are black and brown, so you're being judged not really by a jury of your peers. And sometimes, I guess, I would think that a judge might have more experience and be um, maybe a little bit more fair than someone, you know, with other biases. Um, I would think the data supports what you started by saying. Uh, historically, the problem hasn't been that um, <coughs> wealthier people um, are too much, or even middle class people are too much on juries. The, the uh, claim was that the only people who could afford to be on a jury were uh, retired people or people without a job they had to go to uh, or housewives. So I, I just think you're wrong on the on the data, uh, improvements have been made on um, getting a full complement of different types of people on juries. Massachusetts has been terrific on that by calling you to be on the jury. And it, what is it, Ralph? If you aren't used within twenty, within one day, you served. One day. It's one this, day or one trial. This has made an enormous difference in Massachusetts. Uh, as to who's sitting on juries. Um, a jury isn't sitting alone without a judge. So with a judge and a jury, in a way, you have the best uh, of both worlds. You, you have the experience of a person uh, who's heard a lot of cases, who knows the law, and you also have the community input. Um, the data shows that when jurors are asked, judges are asked, judges are asked, and litigants are asked, they all end up very favorable uh, to having a jury. Um, I would agree with you, I'm a little nutty on this issue. Um, I love trying jury cases. Um, I thought being in front of 12 people, good and true, and explaining yourself was fabulous. And my clients 
if we lost a clay case before a judge, <coughs> the clients inevitably would think they were all he's then, uh, that he was prejudiced. When they lose a case in front of a jury, it's, we gave it our best shot. The community's spoken. So at least from a litigant's point of view, there's a certain legitimacy of having both a judge and a jury. But I, I'm not the most neutral human being in the room on this topic. We know that. Okay, I am. Is Justice Forrest still here? He is still here. Uh, it's after 12 years of the trial court judge the Superior Court. Uh, and for every trial, and I expect that the court probably did the same, uh, after the verdict came in, I would speak to the jury uh, with regard to, uh, not with regard to the content of the deliberations. The fact of the matter is, I do not know any judge, especially any Superior Court judge, and we try the most serious criminal and civil, the most serious criminal cases and the civil cases uh, involving the, the most money and the most moment. There's not an enormous respect for jurors. Uh, the fact of the matter is, juries are collectively better than any single one of us. Uh, there is probably no more, there's no doubt that we can do better with regard to diversity, but frankly, uh, you are not going to find any more diverse group of individuals than you are on a jury. Uh, working class, middle class, uh, upper class, uh, obviously we are working to make sure that it is diverse in terms of persons of color. But we're relatively diverse in persons of color in most of our counties, not so much in Norfolk County. Uh, but, uh, uh, and the fact of the matter is, juries are extraordinarily conscientious. They are consistently impressive in terms of their ability to think through it. And a remarkable part of the jury system is we bring 12 people together, Democrats, Republicans, whites, African Americans, Hispanics, persons who are uh, persons who are well off, persons who are not, uh, and in 99 percent of the cases, they reach unanimous agreement. Uh, that's a rather extraordinary thing to do, uh, and it does say something about what can happen if you create a realm in which persons are uh, invited truly to listen to both sides. They do hear both sides in a trial, uh, where they are given rules by a judge that is to knock out matters which are unduly prejudicial. They are provided with the rules of the game, specifically the laws that must govern them. They are given an oath to uphold their obligations to follow those rules and to, uh, and to be true to their oath. And the fact of the matter is, juries do a remarkable job. Uh, juries are not a bashing, but a bashing uh, they're not banishing in the state court system, certainly not in Massachusetts. Uh, most trial judges I know are spending most of their day on the bench trying cases. Uh, I think we need to distinguish between civil cases and criminal cases. Uh, if criminal case, if they're banishing in criminal cases, and I know that they are in the federal court, it is because uh, mandatory minimums and sentencing practices have made it uh, so challenging for a defendant to throw the dice to go to trial that most cannot afford to. Uh, where there is an enormous, where there is an enormous difference between what your sentence will be if you plead guilty versus what your sentence will be if you are convicted at trial, very few defendants can afford to take that risk, uh, and that is a result, uh, to some extent, of the uh, sentencing guidelines and as said, of the mandatory minimums, um, which have increased that differential. That differential, I agree, to be a problem. Uh, for justice, and so uh, in a criminal case, the defendant should be able to go to trial without risking a materially different and higher sentence for doing so. Uh, in the civil realm, it is a bit of a different uh, area because the issue is ultimately one of can can they reach agreement? And the fact of the matter is, uh, I may disagree with Mr. Super a little bit this um, about this. Uh, if all of our cases went to trial, we'd be, we'd be shut down. Uh, we need, there is nothing inconsistent with case management and being efficient in terms of governing discovery and also permitting individuals to go to trial. I was one of those, and I think most of us in Superior Court were among those, who basically said the surest way to resolve a case is to give a, is to give a firm and true trial date. 
there are many a times I would say to counsel, this case is going to be over next week. Uh, it's going to be over either because I'm going to try it, or it's going to be over because you're going to settle it. Uh, and uh, I am perfectly content when uh, the parties agree to settle a case if they settle it for the right reason. The right reason is they decide that they would rather reach agreement than take the risk of going to trial. That is fine. Uh, a bad reason for going to, to for, for settling is because they don't think they can get a trial in an appropriate amount of time, or the cost of trial is too great. Uh, so one of the ways in which we can ensure that individuals are able to go to court and to obtain jury trials is to address the overall cost of litigation and make sure that co that cost of dispute resolution is not so high that persons cannot afford to bring those cases to court and have those disputes resolved in a court of law. A, a number of years, um, I was called to serve on juries uh, in, in the normal course of things. Um, and uh, ordinarily, I was excluded, uh, A, because I was a lawyer, and B, because I um, had worked in city government um, on issues of uh, youth violence and had uh, a record uh, for having uh, gone after gangs and others on one side or the other. Uh, once they got that information, decided to uh, not select me to serve on the jury. But finally, uh, about two years ago, I was called to serve um, uh, and uh, sat on a jury which uh, this is a Suffolk County jury and, and was um, a really a wonderfully a diverse group of individuals. Um, teachers and mechanics and uh, men and women, people who were young and, and uh, people who were of my age um, from across the county. Um, and we had uh, a very sensitive case which in going into uh, the matter I assumed would have come out in a particular way. Um, it involved uh, child molestation and inevitably one would assume that that there are some biases there. Uh, but we, we got into the jury room and had um, what I have to say was a, really an astonishingly uh, rich conversation uh, about uh, the evidence that had been presented, uh, the credibility of uh, the people who had uh, presented that evidence, uh, what the context of the situation was, um, and, and we uh, came out with uh, uh, a, uh, a verdict that we all considered uh, unanimously uh, to be uh, very fair and just uh, for all involved. Um, and I remember walking out of the courthouse actually being a little bit surprised, not so much at the quality of the conversation, but that we had actually uh, been able to resolve some very, very uh, tough, sensitive, uh, of family issues. Um, and I, for one, would have to say that uh, having, after all these years, finally served on a jury, uh, it, it reaffirmed my faith in uh, the quality of, of uh, justice that um, a jury can bring to a particular child, a, a trial, particularly in a way where I think we all agreed that the that the verdict was one that might ultimately end up bringing that family back together uh, rather than uh, creating a verdict that uh, would have left the, the participants um, hating each other um, over a period of time. So I, I, I think that um, juries, uh, certainly in, in Massachusetts, um, are fairly uh, impaneled. Uh, and there is a, a very good amount of diversity on those juries in terms of uh, race and economic status and um, the nature of the work that people do. Um, and um, I think that uh, the comments that we got at the end um, justified uh, the work that we did. Uh, Polly Wilbert, Salem, Mass. Oh, I guess one of the things that I would like your view on is this issue of poverty. And um, when Director Bowman talks about a single person with a net worth of $15,000 a year 
um, being poverty. I can't imagine anyone living successfully on this coast or on the west coast at that amount of money. I assume you would need a tent to live in the woods. So how do we work with what is an inherently unfair assessment or determinant of access when you're using um, standards that cannot possibly be fair. Um, if you took the cost of living in San Francisco or the cost of living in Boston and you applied them to what you needed to not be impoverished, I can only imagine that you're talking about $45,000 a year. I'd just be interested in how we work with that kind of level of, of successful interface economically to allow access to justice? That's a good question. I personally feel like one of the mistakes that was made when the Legal Services Corporation was created was that it was um, targeted to very, very low income. I think that's one of the reasons that it's always under attack. If you compare it to the Medicare, where everyone is eligible for it after a certain point in time, um, everybody's got a vested interest in it. And so I think that there are some things that could have happened with the creation of Legal Services Corporation, which would have made it more available to people who could not afford to pay. The problem with it is that even though the guidelines are very, very low, we still turn away 64% of people who are eligible. We still can't provide services to everyone who needs it. And so I think for the people who are near poor, low, uh, moderate income, for those people, we have to begin to look at what else is available. And in Massachusetts, there are a couple of different um, sort of incubator type programs. Um, one is at UMass School of Law, where they have taken graduates of law school and sort of help them go through a mentoring learning process where they have a sliding fee scale and they're providing legal services in that fashion. And a number of people who would not be eligible for legal services are able to get helped. I think we can do more of those kinds of programs. There used to be something called Judicare, which was the um, <coughs> alternative, the legal alternative to Medicare. Um, that program didn't do well, and one of the reasons it didn't do well was because people in private practice were saying, you're undercutting our services. And so I think that we have to think about something that will work both for people who are small, medium, or solo practitioners, and then something uh, for people who are so poor that they can't even pay a sliding fee scale. When most criminal cases are settled out, what's the word? Question is, in a plea bargaining case, is the defendant always represented by an attorney? Or are they left? And the answer is yes. No. no, the answer is yes. I mean, well, unless the defendant chooses not to be, uh, but we do have a right to counsel. Uh, and so the issue in the criminal case is not whether or not you have counsel. Uh, uh, there may be an issue with regard to the adequacy of counsel. Uh, we are actually quite blessed in Massachusetts that our public defenders, although horrendously underpaid, uh, are quite good. Uh, so <clears throat> there are some states, uh, Louisiana among them, uh, which finance their public defenders only through fines and fees, uh, and they are horrendously underfunded uh, with regard to it. Uh, again, our attorneys are <coughs> woefully underpaid, uh, and uh, but the fact of the matter is, every defendant does have does have counsel and a right to counsel. I guess a question of, of fact: um, the sixty four percent that Dr. Bowman was talking about, and the um, hundred percent of the criminal cases uh, that are are covered. How do how do you make determinations? Just a uh, deep dive into how you make choices, really, for those people who you don't absolutely have to give counsel to. There are difficult choices. And so one of the things that we do is we look at 
what are the critical issues that affect people's livelihood? Access to food, shelter, safety. And so those become priorities. So there are certain cases that legal aid will take and then certain other cases that we won't take. So if you're a poor person who has a dispute with Geico Insurance Company, for example, that's not a case that we're going to take. Uh, but if you're a poor person who is about to be evicted from your housing and it's a subsidized housing, then we'll take that case. We have questions and, and looking at facts to determine whether or not we'll take, say, someone who's being evicted from private housing. Because if you're being evicted from private housing, there are certain things that can happen. Um, landlords have a way of raising the rent, for example, and if you can't pay it, we might be able to save you one month, but you'll be back in the same place, maybe in two months. And so we decide we're not gonna take that case because we're not gonna make a difference. So we're looking at cases that we can make a difference. We're looking at cases that impact people's ability to avoid destitution. Um, I'm, uh, I joined the woman up here being uh, more than a little skeptical about many juries. Um, and I'm curious about what it is like in Tennessee where Jackie practiced her early on in her career and other places, especially in the South, with juries, are they, are they representative of the community? And, what, and they may be better than elected judges in many parts of the country, but uh, why would I want to have a jury? I've been on a jury once in my life. I sat two weeks on Judge Sikora's trial, an armed robbery case. And it was the most amazing experience, quite frankly, of my life. Two weeks watching a fair-minded, intelligent person in, in action. The jury was, to me, not only useless, but expensively useless. The case could have been decided with him in the first day. It was so cut and dry. The guy, armed robbery, caught the people half a mile away. It was like cops, you know, like a cartoon cops and robbers thing. Um, again, it was a waste of time, in my opinion. Um, and again, Massachusetts, but my, I guess my overall comment is more about the rest of the country. Yeah, maybe it's representative in Massachusetts, but what is it like in the rest of the country? Hearing Brian Stevenson at Harvard a month ago, it didn't sound like it yet caught up uh, in parts of the country where a jury would be a good thing to have. Especially, again, where there's also a jury, not of your peers, and an elected judge, not Mitch Sikora. So where I was in Tennessee, um, we did have a diverse jury. I, I practice in Western Tennessee, and so in Western Tennessee, um, paternity cases uh, could be tried in front of a jury. And I was doing family law, and so we tried paternity cases in front of a jury, and we had a fairly diverse for that part of Tennessee jury. But we also had elected judges. And so I think that in some cases, I would strongly urge someone to go for a jury trial as opposed to appearing in front of an elected judge because it depends upon who is arguing the case on the other side. Now, if you've got an attorney who's got a lot of money and they're funding that judge, you might do better with a jury trial, even if it's not exactly a, a jury of your peers. Uh, so I think it depends upon the circumstances. I think that we can't always assume that judges understand what real life is. Judges in the room are excluded, but <laughs> some judges just don't know what it's like to have to put two pennies together to be able to buy food for your family. And so in some of those circumstances, you might do better with people who understand real life. And not, not every jury has Henry Fonda on it either, right? <laughs> so, so we have here a very serious question. How can we provide access to justice for many people who can't afford to pay for lawyers? And our panel consists of lawyers, uh, one who adjudicates cases, one who represents people who are um, qualified to get legal services, and one, God forbid, who trains more lawyers, right? Uh, and so, so it, 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 it's not surprising uh, that 
one of the solutions that we hear for how to provide food more access to justice is more funding for the lawyers. Uh, but as Professor Subin said in his very astute remarks, uh, one of the things that's happened over many years, many of which we would applaud, uh, is that many new rights continue to be created. And providing lawyers to vindicate all those rights it is expensive. So my question is, other than paying for more lawyers, which I'm dealing with law school, I like to pay for lawyers, um, uh, what other things are available uh, to increase access to justice uh, that might be applicable to large numbers of circumstances and large numbers of people besides providing more services to funding for lawyers? Uh, Jackie will help me with this. Uh, one thing that we can do, given the number of individuals who are representing themselves or will be doing so with very little help, uh, is to simplify our court processes to make our forms clearer, to help individuals be able to identify, to present the facts, to identify what their claims are, what the defenses are, uh, to provide self-help videos sort of turbo tax for filing complaints and answers. Uh, there are already models for that. We need to we need more of them. We need money to finance it, and we need to translate them into seven languages. Uh, uh, we also need to be having individuals to be working on mediation. We are moving towards a model which was identified in the 1970s by Professor Sander of the Multi-Door Courthouse. Uh, there are many different ways to resolve disputes. We'd like to be able to identify which is the most sensible way to resolve a dispute. In a family law case, as Jackie knows better than me, uh, if it is an amicable divorce to the extent there is such a thing and there is relative agreement with regard to child custody, you do not need to have the same process as when there is a divorce which is being caused by domestic violence or where there is drug abuse among, one of, among the father, the mother, or with regard to the children or serious mental health issues. Those call for a somewhat different approach with regard to it. So the capacity to simplify processes, the capacity to identify appropriate triage so that those who truly need help are the ones who are getting help, uh, the ability to provide more individuals to provide various services. Uh, in housing courts, it is critical that we diminish the extent it is okay for someone to lose their home uh, through eviction, but not okay for them to go homeless. Uh, so the capacity in a housing court to be able to allow those individuals who may be potentially losing their home to be able to rebound and find housing and not fall into homelessness with all that that means for them and for their families and for their kids uh, are things that we can accomplish. So uh, uh, one of the wonderful things about being, in, there are two wonderful things about being involved in access to justice. Uh, one is there are really quite terrific people doing it. Uh, people like Jackie and others who are extraordinarily committed to it. It is quite a wonderful community to be a part of. The second quite wonderful thing is how much there is to be done. Uh, if there are those who don't think there is work to be done, then please join with regard to matters of access to justice because there really are an enormous number of things that can be done by an enormous range of people, uh, including people who are not lawyers. Uh, the capacity of having organizations, social workers, clergy, to be able to know people's rights and when they come to them, they can help them to guide them to where they can find help. Uh, the capacity to have uh, resources available that to provide information to those individuals and to help those persons to be both, both access and understand it can be done by non-lawyers as well as lawyers. So uh, there are many things which are discouraging, especially if one looks at the extent of if one looks at the fact that the uh, <coughs> president once again has sought to eliminate public uh, uh, funding for legal services, the good news is Congress did not listen to him last year and I hope not listen to him this year and will fund legal services to some extent. Um, uh, but there's also a great deal of things that are being done, a great deal of use of technology, a lot of imagination and creativity. So. Uh, it, is not, it does not make sense to be discouraged, it makes sense to get involved. I think you covered a lot, a lot of the issues. I think one of the things that we need to do is look at the court systems themselves. Why does it have to be so complicated? And do things to make it easier for people to be able to 
access the justice that they need. I also think that we have to do more in terms of educating people about what their rights are. If people understand what their rights are, you know, you can't use the court in order to beat up on your, you know, opponent. Um, a lot of people, particularly in the family law arena, want to go to court because they want their stories to be told. They want to know. They want everyone to know how horrible that person is and how they cheated on them and how they did this and how they did that. Well, that's not the purpose of court. And I think that if we can educate people more about what court is, what court can do, and contrast that with what people can do for themselves, then I think we can decrease the people, the number of people who need to rely on courts. And then I think we also have to look at where do we really need to have a trier effect, whether it's jury or judge. Not everything that we do needs to go to court, or should have to go to court. And are there alternatives to going to court to deal with some of these issues? Alternative dispute resolution is one of those things. But there might be some other things that we can do and look at. And I think technology is a major issue. Um, making it accessible. We've got programs where librarians, law librarians and public librarians are helping people connect with information about the law and helping people figure out what it is that they can do. We also have things like uh, mass answers online where somebody can submit a question to a group of lawyers or law students and get an answer that will be a verified answer, which might help in some cases avoid going to court. So I, there are a number of those kinds of things that are going on. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Is this on? Can you yep. hear? I have a question for anyone here or members of the panel. Um, we, we have an experimental laboratory at the uh, Northeast University School of Law l looking at ways of educating uh, clients to uh, help themselves. There's an enormous amount of data, as you mentioned, that having a lawyer dramatically changes results. What I don't know is whether educating people to represent themselves better or having non-lawyers represent them, I don't know if we have the data yet to show that that will come close to the impact of having a lawyer. Does anyone know whether there have been studies of that? Jim Greiner. Because, you know, I, it makes sense to me to educate people to represent themselves, but I sure wish we had some data similar to having lawyers showing the good results. Uh, they're actually, I mean, you are correct. The data is very difficult to do. Uh, there was an interesting study which was happened in Massachusetts uh, with regard to housing court. Uh, it was meant to be a controlled study of a housing court in, uh, in Quincy District Court, as well as a, as well, I'm sorry, a, a district court, which is not a housing court, in Quincy, uh, and a housing court in the Northeast, in Lawrence and Lynn. Uh, controlled group, some share of them received access to attorneys, uh, the others did not. Uh, the study was done with the view of attempting to demonstrate the importance of obtaining counsel. Uh, the results of it were interesting and perhaps confounding to those who started it, which was uh, there was the expectation that you'd be better off in housing court than in district court, uh, because housing court has all sorts of uh, resources and uh, mediation. Uh, it turned out that what was incredibly important to do with regard to that district court is that there were two quite extraordinary attorneys uh, who were prepared to bring cases to trial. Uh, and in housing court, if you bring cases to trial and you win, the landlord may very well have to pay attorney's fees with regard to the claims. Uh, and they had a judge in Quincy who was prepared to set a trial date. Uh, and telling counsel if they win, I will award the attorney the fees to which they are entitled. They never went to trial. Uh, and when you ask the judge, you know, how come, you know, the judge said, I didn't do anything. I didn't try any of these cases. Uh, but what the judge did 
was the judge set trial dates and basically made clear that if they were to prevail, they were to be awarded fees, and that fundamentally changed the negotiating posture with regard to those cases. In the other court, in the housing court, uh, there was a lawyer for the day program. Uh, so for those individuals who did not get attorneys, they did receive a lawyer for the day. The lawyer for the day came from the same legal service organization that would be providing full-time lawyers. Uh, most of those cases were resolved through mediation. There was only one judge in that particular court, and the mediators made it relatively clear that uh, getting a trial date is not going to be uh, a realistic thing to expect. Uh, and it turned out that it did not matter much whether or not you were being given a lawyer for the day or had an attorney, uh, because both because those who did not get counsel received a lawyer for the day and had some degree of assistance, uh, but also because uh, there was not a really a viable opportunity for the cases to go to trial and it could not change the negotiating posture. So these things are complicated. Uh, what it says is that great judges and great attorneys matter. Uh, and the, the willingness of being able to, the ability to go to trial and to have attorney's fees awarded with, because the statute provided for it can make an enormous difference in terms of the negotiating posture. Thanks. I, I just, um, it's really interesting in an anecdotal perspective in response to the question, which is that, at least in my experience, I worked with, um, for many years, an organization that does pro bono services in an area where matters often, it, you know, it's never about getting to trial. It's about having the lawyer pick up the phone or write the letter. And so sort of information about how to go pro se, how to represent yourself in court, is not really getting at the fact. And this is often, for example, with like medical debt. You know, simply having the lawyer call the ambulance company and saying there's a mistake here, people, it almost never gets to anyone even doing something called settlement. It just, right, it's very informal. Whereas when people, um, particularly people who um, are often facing multiple problems in life or are uneducated, are trying to deal with it themselves. So I think it's important to recognize that access to justice is not only access to the courthouse, it's access to justice way back down the line, you know, when you get the bill that doesn't make sense, when your electricity's turned off and you don't know why, when you're fighting with your landlord, all kinds of things that when people have a lawyer or have the capacity to represent themselves ably, it never gets further. But without that, it can start ricocheting into something that can end up in court. And I don't know how we measure that, but certainly anecdotally, and I suspect um, legal services has this experience, it's often preventing things from becoming cases. All right, we got time for one more question. Um, I just wanted to comment on uh, Jackie's uh, point where, you know, we're a nation that we think we're good at everything, but we're not good at this uh, when it comes to the, you know, judicial system. And I was wondering, you know, there's, there's a lot of references to Europe right now in terms of gun control. And I don't want to get into that part of it, but in terms of are there examples, an, an example that you could point to um, in Europe, let's say, where they have a better system, or they face some of these problems and overcome them with a different system? The one that immediately comes to mind is England, but it's England is not by itself. Um, and just recently, England, because of the cost of uh, providing lawyers to people who can't afford it, uh, revised their uh, legal aid system so that they could uh, decrease the number of people who would be entitled to counsel. But one of the things that I think is a good system to look at is the English system, and then also, to some extent, the Canadian system. Um, they both look at ways to provide access to counsel, um, not just in court cases, but in disputes that start early on. And so I think looking at the English system is, is one way of doing it. Looking at the French system um, is another way. And then the United Nations um, has a protocol for access to justice. And I think looking at their protocol and looking at what are the elements that make a good system uh, would be places that I would suggest starting. So I think we all agree we had a spectacular set of panelists.